Well, good morning. We are in our last message of Little Jesus' Big Changes sermon series. And uh, isn't it amazing how God kind of planned all that out? That wasn't in my planning. So James will be here next week because I'm with Youth Retreat, James Biddendorf. And then we'll start new sermon series the week after that. And it's not quite formulated yet. So we'll, uh, you'll just have to come and see what the plans are for two weeks. And... Uh, so we're, we're in our last, our last sermon here talking about a changed, changed community. And we're in Luke 2, verses 22 through 38. It was a longer passage, so I don't have all the words on the screen. If you'd like to open Bibles and follow along with me as we read Luke 2, starting in verse 22 through 38. Let us read. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they, this is Mary and Joseph, brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for your glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. May God add his blessing this morning. God, as we open your word today, we come to you, and Lord, that you would open our hearts. Lord, that we see in Samuel and Hannah, Lord, that devotion, and Lord, that willingness to be moved by your Holy Spirit. So we pray, God, Holy Spirit, come upon us now. Lord, move us as your people. Lord, encourage us with your words of comfort and assurance that you are there. And Lord, that you've got a plan for our lives for today and for tomorrow. And we pray, amen. Little Jesus, Jerusalem was a changed community because of this. Now, we are creatures of habit and upbringing, aren't we? We like the status quo. We find refuge in the patterns of our lives, and we find comfort in the familiar habits Anybody got any? Anybody got any habits? Are you in the habit of coming to church on Sunday? I look around the room and say, yeah, this crew is one that is pretty much here every Sunday. Thank you for that habit of coming to church. It feels good. It's comfortable. The faces are familiar. Anybody have any mannerisms? Whatever they might be. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) Are there your mannerisms, your facial expressions? If I went to your parents' home or the home that you were raised in, would I find those mannerisms in that home as well too? Right? Yeah. The familiar phrases. 
I'm going to sneak right behind you there. Right? That's more of a Minnesotan thing, but my daughter was made aware of that one when she was living in Ohio. And they said, yeah, you kind of talk funny. You have these funny phrases like, I'm going to sneak right behind you there. She kind of said, what? She said, yeah, you say that. Like if you're you know, in the kitchen, you say, I'm going to sneak right behind you there. So it's a Minnesota thing. We don't even know those mannerisms that we've been growing up until we go somewhere where they kind of go, I've never heard that one before. Patterns. What's your weekly pattern look like? Hmm? How about last week? The familiar patterns, the schedule, the plans, they're familiar, they're known, they're comfortable. We tend to enjoy the known and the comfort spaces. How about those habits? Ever tried breaking one? Uh, right? Not comfortable, not easy. Serving a church in Hudson, kind of like the original church here, the steps seven or eight up to the front doors. In the old days, there's no windows on the doors, just the, the big, imposing door, right? And they told me after they had been at church and attending for a while, they became quite, quite active in the church. They tell me about that initial day that they came to the church. And their plan was to get up and check out First Baptist Church of Hudson, Wisconsin. And it was a beautiful day. The weather didn't keep them from going. They were kind of hoping it would. And they looked at the imposing set of flight of stairs. It's a beautiful old church, you know, built in the 1880s. And it was white and all that stuff. And she says, and then there were the doors, in her words. We had to walk through the doors. What was behind the doors? She said, we almost didn't come in just because of it was uncomfortable to do something different, to go in a place that was unknown, even though we had made the plans to check out the church. She said, and of course, we came through the door, and it was wonderfully warm and welcoming, and, and they stayed and all that kind of stuff. But, oh, right? The, how uncomfortable is that to do something out of the norm? They confessed they almost didn't come in the doors. It's not a sermon on a welcoming presence in our church. It's a sermon on how uncomfortable is it doing something out of our norm? Our mannerisms, those are really tough ones. Like I said, some of them we don't even, we're not even aware of. In the patterns, have you ever had to change your work schedule? Oof. Uh, Jeremy, uh, without his permission, on uh, Tuesday night, he's our men's night, he does the, the seven on, seven off night shift, right? I mean, you have to like, change your daily pattern so that you can survive that. And now he's in his pattern for uh, years and, and he loves it, but it's really, really tough when you've got to change that pattern and that schedule. We all like our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, and then when the habits and the mannerisms and the schedules are all good, right? And our story today, Samuel and Hannah, faithful people doing good things for the Lord. Oh, it's even harder to move us from what is good and what feels comfortable and what is known. So we turn to Simeon and Hannah in our text today. Verse 25, Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and he was devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. We'll get to the consolation of Israel in a second. Right? Simon was devout. He was you guys. He's coming to Sabbath every Saturday. Probably started on Friday night for him too, right? He was devout. He was a Hebrew. He was a follower of God. He knew his Bible and he practiced the religion faithfully. We call him the church guy. He's the church guy. But Simeon was waiting for a change, wasn't he? As wonderful as a spiritual life was, as devoted as he was, we are assuming he was coming to the end of his earthly life. It wasn't quite right yet for Simeon. It says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And if you're like me, you're kind of like going, yeah, right over my head. What? 
For thousands of years, Israel had proclaimed salvation would come to the world through them. Right? This was God's story and his message for them. I brought you out of Egypt, I brought you to the promised land, and I am going to deliver to you a Savior. Isaiah 52.10 says, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. It is coming it's not here yet in Simeon's time. God isn't finished. There's work to be done. Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Hebrews were waiting for their salvation. They were waiting for God to save them. Unfortunately, so many were waiting for a physical king. Remember, the ex, not the Exodus, they're taken away by the Babylonians, the temple's destroyed, there's the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant is not there, the Shekinah glory of God is not there, they're waiting for God to rule Israel again, to come and be that physical king on earth. But Simeon was aware it would be more than a salvation for the Hebrews. He was aware of the Isaiah text that it would be a salvation unto all people. And Simeon knew his Isaiah prophecy and he was waiting. And he was told he would not die before he saw the consolation of Israel. He knew his other Isaiah text. He knew this text Isaiah 49.6, it's too easy of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. It's too easy to be just the redeemer of Israel. That's a piece of cake. I will give you, this is Messiah prophecy, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is Isaiah, right? Simeon knew it wasn't just for the Hebrews, that the Messiah would come, it would be the light to the entire world and not just Israel. So Simeon was in the habit of reading and praying and worshiping. His habit and his pattern was to go to the temple to experience God through his word, his written word, and his word given through the prophets to the people of Israel. He knew his Bible. However, the Holy Spirit revealed to him he would not see death until he had seen, in the text, the Lord's Christ. I love that. Luke writes it as the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Savior, is being sent. God's salvation. And God kept his promise. We know the story. Simeon came to the temple in the spirit. Uh, just a quick Luke and aside. Luke loves talking about the Holy Spirit. We're only in the second chapter of Luke. What are we, the, getting toward the end of Luke chapter? He's already mentioned the Holy Spirit eight times in the first two chapters. And we're just in Jesus' infancy right now. So the Spirit is a big thing for Luke. If you're reading through Luke, just kind of pay attention to that. So uh, God kept his promise. In the Spirit, he comes into the temple. The work of the Holy Spirit is the main theme of the book of Luke. And again, he comes in the Spirit into the temple. Now remember, this is before the resurrection, obviously. Right? We've got the Holy Spirit at work in Simeon, and there's no doubt about it. This is, you know, he was in the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Luke is really clear. The Holy Spirit is working specifically in Simeon here. It's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't active before Jesus. And we all know about Acts when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all people. It doesn't mean it didn't exist before. And we see the Holy Spirit working here, moving Simeon, to the temple 
and specifically to where Jesus was with mom and dad. And I love the image. And upon seeing him and holding him in his arms, what mother doesn't hate the stranger putting your hand on your belly? How far along are you pregnant, right? It's like, what? Here's Simeon grabbing little baby Jesus and holding him in his arms. He's going, oh, man, what is going on here? And then Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. The promise was fulfilled in Simeon's life. His life had been changed. See, and not just his life for the fulfillment of this prophecy that he'd see Jesus, right? But, but how God interacts in the world is now changed. How God interacts in the world is now changed in Jesus. Luke 16, Jesus says, The law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. Since then, the gospel of the kingdom is preached. Old Testament, we got the law and the prophets. That's how God primarily speaks to his people. Now, the kingdom of God is preached. Simeon's revelation Two aspects of this change. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. That's the consolation he's talking about. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. I call it the consolation of light. They rejoice that the light has come. Isaiah 49.6 it's not enough for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the protected ones of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations, as I read before. The consolation of Israel is that God's light would shine upon the whole world, not just upon Israel, but upon all the nations of the kingdom. And that Isaiah prophecy has come true in Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Consolation of light. That's what Simeon says. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. Those guys are going to hear God's word now. And then he says, and for glory to your people Israel. Right? How is Jesus bringing glory to the people of Israel? Not that Israel would be really faithful. Okay? Glory doesn't come to Israel in their faithfulness. Actually, the opposite happens. The glory is that God had come into the world through Israel. That God's word was true. That God was the one and only true God, creator of the world, and has given redemption to the world through his son. See, it's Israel's glory is not to become really, really wonderful people. Romans 11 says the opposite a hardening has come upon the part of Israel. And is that not true? It is so hard to convert a Jew today. A hardening has come upon the part of Israel until, until the full number of Gentiles comes in. So until the Gentile world is converted, then Israel will be saved. These are Jesus, this is Romans 11. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, the redemption of or the consolation of Israel. The deliverer comes from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Talking about Israel. He will not abandon them. He will not leave them. But until the Gentiles come to faith, then that will happen. All Israel will be saved, Paul writes in Romans. Meaning, not that every Hebrew will be saved, but that the Hebrew and the Gentile will be saved. That Israel has been expanded to mean every person of God and faith in God. And we live in that era, that era of the hardening of Israel. And we are hoping and waiting for the next change. Until the full number of Gentiles come in, then Israel will be saved. 
Simeon was promised and was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That the Messiah would come through the prophecy and eventually the salvation to the whole world, including Israel. There's a second person of interest in our story. Another person of habit and pattern, Anna or Hannah. And she was old too. We assume Simeon was old. It doesn't say specifically that he was old, but it implies when he says, now I can be at peace when I die. So we're assuming he was old. Hannah, we know she was old. They actually give the years. How many years she was married, how many years she was divorced, and she's 80-some years old. And the text reads that this was her habit and her pattern. She was worshiping with fasting and prayer day and night. Do you know those prayer warriors in your life? Those that worship with fasting and prayer day and night. Now, how many of us would call that worship, though? Right? The Greek here indicates that this is a worship of service. So we've got worship in our hearts, and then we have the worship in what we do. You know, may our, may our walk, may our walk, talk, may our talk, walk. What we believe, may we actually do that. The Greek here is, is how she lived out her faith was in prayer and fasting, never leaving the temple. Here's a faithful person of habit and pattern, right? So the outward sign of her inward faith, she had the gifts of prayer and the discipline of fasting. And this is how she was called to serve the Lord. The word is translated in my translation as worship, means worship in service. She had a routine. Now, whether her coming to the temple in that location where Mary and Joseph were, were part of her routine or not, or whether the Spirit led her to where Mary... The temple's not a little place. It's a little bit bigger than Thomastown Covenant Church. Yeah. No, no matter whether it's part of her routine or not, God brings them together. And Luke says that after she met Jesus, she taught not the consolation of Israel, but the redemption of Jerusalem. So Simeon is praying for the consolation of Israel, and Anna is looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. What does that mean? we got to go back to Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Messianic text, we're talking about Jesus who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Here, Isaiah 52, 8. The voice of your watchmen, that's us, or Simeon and Hannah. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together, they sing for joy. For eye to eye, they see the return of of the Lord to Zion. Who's seen the return of the Lord to Zion physically? Simeon and Anna. Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. That's what she's referring to. She's referring to the Isaiah messianic text He has redeemed Jerusalem. In seeing Jesus, Hannah turns from a contemplative, prayerful, fasting warrior of the Lord into a proclaimer of the good news. She gives thanks to God and tells all who were waiting, the redemption of Jerusalem has come in this little baby Jesus. Wow, isn't that cool? The redemption of Jerusalem, way back in Isaiah 52. Simeon had been changed, a change that he was looking forward to. Hannah had been changed, most probably a surprise to her when she came across Jesus. Changed from a contemplative, prayerful warrior to a proclamation that the kingdom era had come And the changes don't stop there. 
in our text. How about Mary and Joseph? Mary and Joseph, Simeon blessing Mary and Joseph, and they marveled at what was said about their son. This is Mary and Joseph, right? I mean, angels giving the messages, you're going to have a baby, even though you're a virgin. The angel talking to Joseph, don't divorce her, marry her, because this is my son. It's not like they weren't, they were without knowing who their infant was. But what amazed them in a text was that Simeon and Anna knew that. That God had somehow prophesied to Simeon that he would see this child on this day. And now we got Anna, this lady who's been prayerful, and now she's proclaiming the Lord's come on the steps of the temple. And they were amazed. They had seen God at work, not only in the little child, but the lives of those around them. And when we see God at work in our own lives, we're called to share that revelation. We're called to share, just like Simeon and Anna did, what God has done in them. Simeon shared with Mary and Joseph, and that was a blessing to them. Hannah shared with those that would listen, those that were longing for the redemption of Jerusalem. And she said, the Redeemer has come. So even as a little child, the Jerusalem community had changed. The atmosphere at the temple was different. Just in Anna, I mean, normally I come and there she is praying, and now she's proclaiming and teaching something new. Ears were perked up. The word was out, pun intended, right? The word was out. That's all good, but I'm still a little leery of change in my own life. You know, my undergraduate degree is mathematics, computer science, and, you know, if-then statements, and, and I like things done logically in an order and things that make sense. But three points in, in what I've observed in here. First is that when things change, the old is not abolished, but it's fulfilled. The old is not abolished, but fulfilled. And we know Jesus' words. I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right? See, when God works in our life, he doesn't throw out everything we have done. We look at the kids and tell them the stories about family and parents and not having to work. And, oh, thankful for that. And God's not going to throw out that family background when they grow up. God's going to bless that. In fact, what we, what we have done in our patterns and those things informs us for our tomorrow. We call that Redemption. God redeems the good and the bad, the good and the ugly. He redeems. He redeems the past. And sure, our sins are washed away, but we still have a memory, and God will still use who we are for the future. The ugly as well as the beautiful days. So if God looks like he's moving in a new way in your life, we certainly grieve the change. But embrace the new as this is God's plan and not mine. He doesn't abolish, but he fulfills. And then I can't read this text without talking about the Holy Spirit. I mean, Luke really pounds home the Holy Spirit's role in this chapter of God's work in the world. You know, when we are moved, as uncomfortable as it is for us, right, it's the Holy Spirit that's moving us. And we could honestly say, that was not my plan, God. I, I kind of quip about Lisa and I when we were first married. We're going to have kids right away. You know, we're, we both like kids. We, we're going to have kids right away. Twelve years later, the first one comes along, right? Yeah. Not my plans, but God's plans. And don't forget Jesus' word for the Holy Spirit. The comforter. You think we need some comfort when God moves us to do something different? Of course he does, right? He's there to comfort us through the change. 
He's spurring us on in a new direction, pouring out his gifts and grace. And never had that gift before. Never seen that gift in someone, someone else. Boy, that's different. But God pours out the gifts of grace and the gifts of love for the task at hand. God empowers us with his power in the world around us for tomorrow, whatever it comes. We need not shy away from that, but we willingly go through that door, that imposing door. I wonder what's behind it. Well, he says, God in my life and whatever it is, I'm going through. So he does not abolish our past. He fulfills it. It's the Holy Spirit that moves the people of God in the world. And his intent is to change the world. That's his intent. Not just us, not to make us uncomfortable, but he changes us, his people, to change the world. Simeon was called to bless and change Mary and Joseph, something they'd never met before. His plan was to make, in her old age, Anna a proclaimer of the kingdom of God. If you think the change won't make that big a difference, that might as well just keep on doing what you're doing, because it's good stuff. There's a good excuse, isn't it? Yeah. Simeon was faithful. Hannah sets about as good a model as anyone we can for prayer and fasting and devotion and dedication to the Lord. But Simeon was called to bless the parents of our Lord. The Holy Spirit comes upon him to be an additional blessing. God's not done with this yet. The Holy Spirit comes upon Hannah, Anna and puts her in the right place so that she can be a blessing to all those who wanted to hear of the redemption, the redemption of Jerusalem. And to see God at work in others, we marvel. And we give God the praise and the honor and the glory. Mary and Joseph, they were not alone. They went in that temple to present Jesus, and they found out they weren't alone. I wonder how important that was to them as they're sent off to Egypt. God has not left us or forsaken us. In Pastor Scott's infinite wisdom, without change, there is no change. Without change, there's no change. We would do well to listen carefully to the Holy Spirit moving in us, right? Simply sharing the work that he's already done. God is at work in us, right? Hearing and being encouraged by others. We can't be encouraged if we aren't hearing what God is doing in others. And the Holy Spirit will renew us and move us. May the Holy Spirit continue to move us. Let us pray. God, we uh, come to you today opening your word. Lord, uh, seeing your impact in the lives of the faithful. Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna. And God, we're reminded that you're a God who moves and continues to move in the lives of your faithful people. And Lord, you move so uniquely and differently in each and every one of us. Lord, right now, today, we have, we have many gifts here in the room. Lord, gifts that we've relied on. Lord, gifts, Lord, that we use in our service and devotion to you. And God, I am sure that Anna didn't stop praying and stop fasting. And Lord, I am sure that until his last days, Lord, that Simeon was still faithful in going to Sabbath worship. And so, God, we pray that you encourage us to continue in our worship and our devotion to you. But, Lord, help us to see that you may not be finished with us yet. God, that you may be moving us in a new way. God, you may be moving us in a way that we've been moving for a long time, but just a little differently. So, Lord, we pray as we make the plans, Lord, that you would move us as you would move us. Lord, you would reveal to us, God, those gifts that will be poured out upon us for tomorrow and the next year and the year after that. 
And Lord, I give you thanks and praise for the faithfulness of this congregation. Lord, as we, as we meet today, as we look back at the past year, oh, that faithfulness has just been so evident to see you working and moving among us. Lord, to seeing a people that are dedicated, Lord, to seeing your word continue, Lord, to be, to be shouted from the mountaintops, from the rivers of the Leaf River, Lord, from the streets of Staples and Motley and Wadena. God, we pray, continue to bless us, Lord, to allow your kingdom to come to others who may be waiting, who may be looking for consolation, Lord, who are in need of redemption. For this is why you have come, and this is why you move us, to give them hope, and Lord, to show them the light of the world. We ask and pray in your holy name. Amen.